Mark Best, we're live. Welcome. Thank you. Thanks for having me. My pleasure. My pleasure. Super quickly for the 1% of people that are listening to this that don't know who you are and your history, and I literally want the, in a nutshell, Idiot's right. Guide to it. Just just give us a rundown, mate. For all those that have been living under a rock, under I'm a rock. Uh, Mark Best. Uh, I'm a chef. I had a very well-known restaurant in Surrey Hills for 17 years, which closed uh, mid-2016. Um, former electrician from the gold fields of Western Australia, worked in the submarines on Cockatoo Island, um, got into cooking late and uh, made a success of it. Yeah. Unintentional success? Unintentional. Never. Uh, my uh, my ambition uh, sort of grew in tandem with my, my experience. So as my experience uh, grew, I was became more ambitious. So Never had a plan, just... Just to escape being an electrician. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it actually sounded it was, horrific. It was just eruptive. Claustrophobic. Yeah. Um, down a rabbit hole. Dickensian, literally. you know, down pit, you know, and uh, and I think it was um, in the battery compartment on a night shift in a Oslo class submarine covered in diesel uh, varnish and fiberglass fiber. And mm. I thought, you know, I've got to change this i can't i'm not going to survive you know what i when i heard you i was listening to something when you were talking on it and a couple of years ago i did this motorbike trip across bolivia and went down this uh, mine that had been there for a hundred years and there's asbestos hanging off there's pits everywhere and people died literally every Mm. week people died and that's what i was picturing when you were doing that job in wa (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> with a little bit Close. more a little bit more governance I, around it I, I like the the, uh, the Bolivian accent is uh, is good I like that That's it's an amazing good. country man <laughs> it was an amazing country you know we we actually filmed the documentary that's coming out really soon which is really good. cool too good I was looking for some comparisons because your restaurant you were like 17 years mm-hmm. 10 years with three hats and the only two really good comparisons i could i could find was yogi Berra, who was the new york yankees who 19 seasons 10 world series and he retired in 1963 and he was earning about 68 grand a year and i thought that's probably well paid for a chef yeah and then there's kelly slater who's 29 years on tour 11 world titles and has got a net worth of 20 million dollars and i'm guessing after all that blood sweat and tears at Mark, that you're somewhere in between that sixty five thousand and and twenty million dollars, <laughs> <laughs> somewhere in between, yeah. <laughs> but I'm just like like clearly it was a, a labor of love for you. But the and we were talking about this before we came online. Mm. The stress of running a, a small business in an industry that's notorious for failure was it literally day by day, week by week, that the pressure was there? Was there ever a period where you just got to relax and enjoy your craft? Um, there were there were moments and there are enough moments to keep you going and to keep you motivated. Um, I think we started in 1999 and uh, we barely survived that first year. But like uh, all small businesses, um, we go in completely un, uh, unprepared mm. for what is required, um, completely undercapitalized. Did you uh, self fund the whole thing? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Good and, for you. And um, and then we just uh, built everything on cash flow. Um, so nothing was expected of us. So we were able to come in at a fairly low level. So in terms of carrying debt and everything, um, that was okay. But then along came the two thousand Olympics, which nearly knocked us on the head. How so? Well, it didn't uh, bring any of the business. That was anticipated. That was anticipated. Brought almost, the competition though, didn't it? Almost none. Um, it bought some some of the bigger pop ups that uh, that opened up. Um, you know, maybe people like Mark Miller and that came into town at those times. I forget what the South American concept was under the overseas passenger terminal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Big places like that. You yeah. know. Um, but I mean more so coming out of the Olympics and uh, the the explosion of, of quality restaurants in Sydney. It kind of all seemed to start then. Yeah, that wasn't really our problem. I mean, it was just simply cash flow. It, it dried up to nothing. We did one table on a Saturday night, you know, wow. because people just either partying locals, locals, yeah. locals took off or um, they were on junkets and were heading out to the out to the games and uh, 
never returned. You know, so yeah, well, I never. But after that, that. Um, we, you know, the accolades kept coming in, and our business, the the type of food that we were doing, and uh, very idealistic, was driven entirely by, um, by the media reviews that we received. Yeah, incredible. The the business skills to run a restaurant completely self taught. Did you ever get any help from anybody, or was it just literally by trial and error? Um, mostly error. Um, we <laughs> <laughs> made a lot of uh, horrendous, te- you know, tactical errors along the way. Um, managed to survive them, but um, give me a couple of the big ones. Oh. Just food choices or... No, not even like going into perhaps pay modern, you know, five years, you know, um, went in there, like the, the business model went in on the best case scenario and it they they rarely pan out, mm. you know, so... And they're hard to extract yourselves from uh, those types of businesses and I had all offshoots of businesses, you know, that um, from Mark. Mm. And Mark was always the engine that sort of kept things going, but it meant we never got ahead because I always uh, get, a, get a bit ambitious and, yeah, funding everything out of cash flow from there. So, um, you know, anyway, you live and learn. So, Would you do it all again? Uh, no. Cause different, it- different times as well. I was talking to Neil Perry yesterday. There's a photo just came up, I don't know, someone's Facebook feed. Memories came up, and there's a picture of me. Oh, I saw that in, Anthony uh, send it to me in Maclay Street Bistro. Awesome photo. Um, people, the, I think the biggest takeaway from that people couldn't get over. I had an earrings in my ears. I'm going, fuck me, it's the fashion. Like, <laughs> I get over it. <laughs> like the then, conservative yeah. world we live in. How yeah. dare you have an earring? Yeah, and then I said, I put them off. They were asking me. I said, they said, I wear the earrings, and I said, no longer in my ears, but I'm still wearing them. They're like, Ugh, you know, so. <laughs> Um, anyway, so it was 1995 and I just won the Josephine Pignolet Award and um, and off I went and I thought the world was my oyster and I was just talking to Neil Perry about it as well. He saw in the post uh, there was a page from the Good Food Guide and uh, they'd just won their uh, third hat and mm. uh, I was just looking at the names there, Claude and Tim Poi was there and uh, a couple of others and uh, just really fascinating times and Neil... And I were both sort of reminiscing, you know, um, just uh, it was more fun. It was more fun back then or you're just was forgetting m- how hard it was back then and it's all just same, same but Relati- different? Relatively. Yeah. It, it, was, it was a barrel of laughs. It was still difficult, as Neil would, would tell you. But um, looking back, um, I think it was much, much easier than it is. What, what, what do you think's changed though? Because uh, profit margins. Because GST wasn't around. Yeah, FBT. FBT. Yeah, because when FBT nineteen eighty six wasn't it? So FBT's yeah. been around for a That's long time. A bit before my time, but yeah. um, but the the GST impacted. GST impacted. Yeah. Yeah. Just just went into cash flow and never <laughs> and no, trying to extract it to, to pay, pay the bills. Pay the bills. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That's what was an issue. Like the, what what profit margin? Because I, I looked at the statistics from Iberswell before I spoke mm. to you today, and like that they're really frightening in this country. Twenty three thousand restaurant businesses, yeah. eighteen billion dollars in revenue, five billion dollars in wages, and the average profit margin of four and a half percent. Like and. Four and a half percent, like it's it's better than cash at the moment, but only marginally. Like, as a high end restaurant, what did you target? That, I mean, that statistic, I'd like to see that on a on a bell curve. I reckon that the the sort of mean average would be around about that. It'd be a long, broad curve because, oh, of course, the failures the fail the failures are enormous. Mm. You know, and then the pointy end of the plane, there's some real successes there's some real successes yeah you look at mr wong you know 27 million dollar turnover last year and yeah probably 20 percent profit margin yeah exactly you know? and so yeah it's like the wealth distribution but they're, in this but they're the unicorns and they're the ones that keep everyone everyone even myself to a certain extent i mean i'm i'm very visible and uh visibly successive uh, successful and everything and i think with the unicorns that keep people coming into the industry and uh you know, um, I think that most are thoroughly un- underprepared. So I, I actually would tell people not to follow their dreams. I said mm-hmm. really to to really think about it and 
have a good hard look, go and talk to your accountant. The accountant would always tell them <laughs> not try to and talk it. them out of it because yeah. it just doesn't make sense. But isn't sense. it, Mark? It, it's it's a bit like the guy that likes surfing, and so he buys a surf shop, and then he doesn't have time to go surfing anymore. Yeah. He's just under pressure. That mm. so many amazing chefs aren't necessarily good business people and by opening a restaurant all they get is less time doing what they love and enormous amounts of pressure or it's something that they're not particularly good at doing well you you find yourself um, spread fairly thin across a small business even like mark i mean when you're self-funded like that and um you can't afford all of the amenity staff that required to run a business like that so you find yourself doing pr marketing and uh, all of that sort of stuff, and uh, you're doing all your financials and the you whole know, thing, in your the whole thing, time. yeah, yeah. <laughs> ironing the tablecloths and cleaning the toilets, and still trying to be creative. And you did it with your wife too, yeah, yeah, Valerie, Valerie, yeah. like, and so there was no diversification of risk for you guys, not all which in, is all in one egg, one basket. Yeah. How is the stress? Like, I, I, I don't reckon I could work with my life, my wife. It, it's stressful enough. Um, we were both having professional jobs. Yeah, we were good in, you know, I was kitchen. She was, was front, front of house. house. Yeah. yeah. It was an old-fashioned model like that and it worked in yeah. that way. And who was the more business-minded of the two? Uh, she was. She was. She would say that um, I overrode her with my enthusiasm for ideas and what we should do and uh, probably – she was more, more, much more pragmatic and conservative. Was she calmer? Of, you seem like a pretty fiery dude. I do. Yeah, I'm not even fired up. Well, no, no, we'll get you fired <laughs> up. We'll start talking about plant based meat or something in a minute. But you seem like and that fire, like a fiery dude, a passionate guy. A guy. I'm like, not passionate. I don't think. I think you're uh, not passionate. Well, yeah. I, I am passionate. Yeah, I mean, I I'm going to have say. this like savage, resting bitch face, which people come to give me. a preconceived notion of the reception they're going to receive and if they're an idiot they get it but yeah, <laughs> so, yeah. but no I'm, I'm just i'm just passionate about things i get mm. um sort of intense about ideas that i had and everything and uh i do my very best to convince people that this is the right way to go mm. and i and if i really believed in it i'd sort of fight to the death on it so it's quite a bit hard to deal with because you must have a, a pretty unique psychology to – it wasn't really your dream. It it, it probably wasn't your passion from mm. the scant pieces that I've listened to mm. and, and read and yet you came in and within a relatively short period of time you were the, you know, one of the best at it in the country and mm. the most recognised in the world. Like that's just someone that's a determined human being. Whatever I'm going to do, I'm going to do it well. I can, uh, I can self-learn, you know, like um, – understand the rudiments of education and that whatever I'm interested in, I'm straight into it. Mm. If I'm going to be building drag engines for boats, I could get into it and I'd be pretty good at it, you know. So yeah. same with my photography. Anything that has this sort of technical basis, I can get in there and and learn it and be good at it. Yeah. I was going to ask you about your photography because you mm. really do take beautiful photos mm. and technical, perhaps you're technically good at it, but you seem to have an incredible eye and it. Most of it seems to be about personalities and about faces pe people. and people. Mm. I don't. I don't. Uh, people find this funny. I don't really enjoy taking photos of food. I find it quite dull. I, but I enjoy the personalities around their industry and um, sort of kept me engaged and passionate um, in terms of the meeting meeting the various personalities. And I have sort of rare access to a lot of the. International people had fantastic photo of Massimo Batura recently on the front of the Good Food Guide, mm. you know, and just um, I'm able to, because I know them quite well, I'm able to just get the more sort of candid shots and go beyond the sort of the media look. Mm, but it seems you get the same with complete strangers. Yeah. Like some of your travel ones, uh, I'm assuming almost... Um, unsolicited that you've just taken them and sometimes I ask yeah. um, sometimes I just keep shooting and so I use um, a bit of humor get in there just chat and just relate to them and just ask them and then just wait until you just get that point mm. there's a thousand photos before you get that one though um, yeah. and uh, you just get that that look and um, 
it needs to be, it may not be how they think they look, but I'm just looking for some sort of truth and it's just some feeling that I get when I look and I go, okay, that's that's what they look like. Yeah. An image an image is is not an exact representation of, of, a, per, of, a, of a person. Yeah. It's, it's something more. What do you reckon you see more than anything in those photographs, particularly with the chefs? Like is it is there a sadness? Is there a, 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 a true passion? Is there regrets? Is it because they 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 seem like deep photos? And I just wonder whether you know I'm not a psychologist, but I'm just wondering All whether right. it is an expression of some of the stuff that goes through your head too. Um, I'm getting deep here. Um, humor, um, intensity. Yeah. Um, Master Chefs ruined the word passion for me, but passion for um, <laughs> but um, is there a story there? I've never watched an episode of my life. Good yeah. for you. Yeah, <laughs> um, I watch your what's the the final knife? Final oh, table. Final table. Yeah. I watched that man. I tried to find it last night, but it's clearly not out yet. What? Yes, it is. Not in Australia on Netflix. I think it must only be in the US. No, it's here. Is it here? Yeah. Wow, it didn't come up. Didn't it? No. The final table because you're looking at the final knife. No, the no, final time. No, I think I, <laughs> that was just you know my no. memory. I'm getting Alzheimer's, man. No, I'm pretty sure I was looking for the final table last night. I, I I had it written down. But back to your photography. Yeah. Do you see like do you literally see emotion in those people? Because it looks like you do when you're taking the photograph. It's just fairly intuitive. I mean, competi- the composition is fairly intuitive. What I'm just looking for is. It's just some feeling. I, I need them looking through the lens. I just need it. They need to engender some feeling in me, some mm. some real response. And there's, I'm always looking for. I keep using this word truth, but there's something they need to just relax, and then and there's something that comes through them. Their their actual personality, a, a true feeling, a a true yeah. response. Yeah, yeah. And is it just a hobby thing for you? You're not doing it professionally. Um, no, I'm not doing it professionally. I mean, Other I've, than I've, the audience I've, that you get from it, yeah, I, I do. I have earned or do earn some money from it um, yeah. from time to time, but but I don't. Again, I don't want to spoil it by making it my main profession. I mean, mm. I don't want to be doing weddings, <laughs> you know. So <laughs> nobody wants to be doing weddings. It's good because you know I earn I earn bits and pieces from it, and you know I get paid for covers of things and yeah, and whatever cool. and, I, and I do it when I feel like it and that's what I just want to maintain the joy in it because it's something that I've done way before I'm you know out of school so I learned the rudiments in high school in South Australia and yeah on film and um, I've always done it so it's just something something that I love to do what do you shoot with now uh just Canon, Canon Canon little Fuji iPhone yeah it doesn't really matter yeah it's more the what you're taking the photo of it's a bit like chefs coming along with a giant knife roll the bigger the knife roll the smaller the talent so it's measured rather <laughs> really? than a fucking guy turn up with like a <laughs> six inch paring knife I'd probably place more value in that so it's people always asking you what lens did you use All what was your shutter no speed idea. what was this you know and like i just go you got Fuck, i don't know I, I think it was the iphone it doesn't matter it's what you capture yeah you no, know it's it's a good point yeah i want to talk a little bit about the industry and your take on it because mm. it seems to be increasingly the bigger getting bigger and the the smaller finding it even more difficult where do, where do you see it all going well the bigger getting bigger is an interesting one. I mean, we, we're sort of seeing big signs if you're looking that we're in a in a in a big bubble. The restaurant industry has been an enormous and growing bubble for a long time, and I think that um, the monopolies that you're seeing um, that's sort of the last line of defence in a sort of post capitalist sort of environment which we're in. Mm. When you say a bubble, what what do you mean? That people are spending too much buying restaurants, building similar, restaurants? Similar to a similar to a housing bubble where you the debt and uh okay. income. Yeah, okay. I've got it. Yeah. So I, I see um massive oversupply. Um so these are very troubling uh troubling um structural problems. Massive, massive oversupply, understaffed, uh, undercapitalized. Banks are no longer lending. Mm. Uh, people have no recourse. Um, 
it's the, the audience is getting is getting thinner um facing sort of financial headwinds as well yeah in australia may or may not being in a, in a recession that sort of discretionary spending is thing the first to go mm. um interesting seeing the stock market like jb hi-fi and harvey norman going through the roof and being rewarded and other other retailers hitting the Falling. floor yeah no so, reason mm. other than other than, operators. other than to have something, electronics is about having something physical and tangible in your hands other than fashion or whatever in other retail or consumables, food, consumables, yeah. you know, the first to go. But isn't there, there also, there's, there's the flip side of that, that some people say they'd rather spend money on experience than things. Like it depends what piece of research you, you, you actually True. read, you know, that, that certain people would rather travel than they would lease a new car or send their kids to a private school or right. you know so and what about I don't think any of think any of that is helping is helping restaurants though yeah but some are thriving some are yeah some are but I think your your statistics there you know 60% first year 80% first 3 to 5 years yeah you know and it's enormous in in any other <laughs> If, if they if, said that that was in the law or yeah, no. plumbers or whatever, I mean, it'd be a national crisis. But here, because we're sort of selling, you know, smoke and hopes and dreams, you know, it's mm. just sort of an acceptable failure rate. And it's been romanticized it by all your crazy TV shows. And Correct. People are, mm. are, are literally blinded by the cold, hard truth of, of just how difficult it is. You know, we, 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 we have a bunch of former chefs that, that work here and we we deal with chefs every day and it's a it's a it's a tough job and like i'm you know i'm a i guess i'm turned out to be i didn't know i was but i turned out to be a pretty creative person i can come up with creative solutions mm. but the thing that drives has driven me through the industry and why i still love it and still love to cook is um my uh, my creativity. I mean, there's just some some need in me that continually needs to be fed by some artistic expression. Yeah. So whether that is cooking or photography or or whatever, I, I just need that in my life, and so that's what's driven me mm. the entire time. If you're not a creative person, where you're just doing the rudiments of the craft, I think it's far more difficult. Mm. You, you, the searching for that, searching for that sort of those ideas and that creativity which never comes mm. and do you think uh and again i apologize i'm an imposter in this space i don't deeply understand restaurants and you know i'm a sure. business guy but i know enough to understand that your restaurant was an incubator for great talent and mm. the one thing that you provided those people was a truly holistic experience of what it meant to be a creative chef mm. whereas and again i apologize to anyone listening that this doesn't apply to but there's a production line mentality with many restaurants out there today and i'd be really curious in your view as to whether that is stifling the the quality and the creativity of of new chefs coming through the system um i think look sometimes you just need to get down there and just get it out, you know, and uh, there is that production line mentality. I mean, even in my restaurant, but my restaurant was a special restaurant. I can name, you know, others, you know, Six Penny, for instance, is another, you know, that sort of Mark Mark 2.0 in a way in the mm. terms of the way it's run and its philosophies and everything. And that's another incubator for, for talent. Yeah, Great talents will come out of there. And there are many other examples mm. of that, but that's, that's small owner-run passionate places which are, are more of as much about ideas as they are cooking's only the medium is more mm. the creative ideas that come out of there um how we engage with people how we engage with farmers producers um what is you know what is our response you know, I mean how are we adding to you know the narrative around australian identity and australian culinary identity these are the sort of things that people like me and my my peers sort of think about mm. you know um not everyone considers the job that to be part of the job but that's you know and that's i attracted people who were like that victor leong and Pasi pettinen and um brent savage and carl furler 
you know, list goes on. Mm. Young people, and I don't take any claim for their talent, but I did, uh, I think, teach them to be creative within that sphere. Mm. What sort of teacher were you? Um, well, going back to that picture that in the, you see me there standing there with a giant gout of flame coming out of um, out of the wok, which was the, sort of the photographic style of the day to show passionate chefs you needed to yeah. show meat of tall flames, which was cooking brandy from memory. It was 95. But uh, anyway, I got plenty of messages from my former colleagues saying, uh, quoting me saying, it's not a fucking flambe, dickhead. <laughs> so <laughs> whenever they'd catch pans on fire or any of this old school stuff would come into the kitchen where they're flaming away and tossing pans, you know, I was all about new school thinking and, you know, none of that came into it, you know. So if you wanted your food to taste like petrol, then go for it, but get the fuck out of my restaurant. <laughs> <laughs> so so I taskmaster said, before gentle yeah, father figure. Carrot and a stick. Yeah. I, I showed them, I showed them the... I showed them the light. I showed them the fucking angels and everything that could be theirs if they, you know, yeah. if they if they thought about it. Um, they need to come to me with ideas that were fully fledged and and they were extrapolations on extrapolations of their original idea, not let's just some dumbass idea they'd come to that mm. they just thought out of you know rolling out of sleep. You know, it need to be well thought out and um, their you know, the principles behind it and their reasoning, you know, why. So it needed to come to me with those fully fledged ideas and I really pushed them. I pushed all of them. Anyone that came into there had to con contribute to that um, creative process and that's, I think, the value that they took out of it. Um, I, they also were not uh, immune to the vagaries of business as well. I told them all about it. They knew everything about what ev everything cost and everything. So I think they mm. came out of it far more uh, market ready than most most places where they're just sort of stuck in a section and on the grill, on yeah. the sorbet section, whatever. I mean, they had a total immersive experience in what it was to live in a creative machine like that. Yeah, it sounds attractive, man. <laughs> People want to get me come fired back. up and yeah. get, get back in there. <laughs> do you think you could do it all again, given all these... Um, draconian labour laws that, that, that are hammering people left, right and centre? Well, you can characterise it as draconian. I mean, but people people have to earn a, a living wage as well. Um, recent people that have taken a big hit from uh, Fair Work Ombudsman, they were not uh, not in this position out of ignorance. They they took a a deliberate risk, a deliberate risk, yeah. And they were they were balancing risk with um, some fairly significant rewards, and they were they were caught out and. So I don't feel sorry for them at all. Just um, tax avoidance in another guy's. Just tax avoidance and wage theft, you know. Yeah. Let's call it what it is. Um, um, and uh, those defending them, you know, they may be scared of who might be shining the, the magnifying glass on them as well. Yeah. So there's no one that's innocent in this, but um, certainly ignorance of the law is no excuse. Yeah. And um, the laws are very, and your your staff are extremely well aware of of their entitlements now, which is good. So they've been educated, mm. and um, anyone running a business now where you're um, waiting for the for the shoe to drop for another disgruntled employee to um, to take you there as an idiot. Mm. Seriously, like you just can't live your life like that. Yeah, there's a lot of idiots out there, though, man. There is, and mm. and the thing is. The point that the Fair Work Ombudsman is trying to make, and and I've certainly had my own uh, run-ins with the Fair Work Ombudsman. We ran a fairly clean business, and um, you know, so it, it wasn't a it wasn't a big deal once we were sort of brought into into line. Um, but if the figures are, are not are not working under current laws, there's a couple of ways you would either change the laws mm. or you know, you don't, you can't run that business. And I said to a lot of people, you can only cook what you can afford to cook. Mm. Um, and if your idea is that you're going to go in there and you're going to do this restaurant, you're going to serve this price point, this many, uh, this this type of produce, um, you need this many chefs to realise your 
creative energies, well, can you afford it? Mm. If the answer is no, the answer is no. Mm. Mathematics. Mathematics. It doesn't yeah. lie. Yeah. You know. I get it, man. You get at the bottom line. Yeah. Yeah, there's there's a two colours, red and black. Yeah. Right? Yes. <laughs> That's it. It's fucking simple, right? Yeah. No, I, I understand. You get it. it. Yeah. I, I And I really do believe that this is the only thing that, potentially changes the industry in any shape or form is if consumers become more willing to pay. They need to pay much, much more. They need to pay much more. Yeah. You know, and I've spoken about this too many times now, so if people have heard it and I'm just on the soapbox, that we, Australia, it's 10% of our income we spend on food. Mm. America, 6.6. Eight in UK and Europe are about much of a muchness, the same kind of low single digits. And mm. then you go to the Asian countries and it's 30 to 40% of their income on food. But we're still predominantly a pub culture. This is this we're is the issue. We we people are much more comfortable yeah. dropping a dropping a hundred on, on a night booze, out yeah. on booze yeah. than they are going to drop a hundred on, on good quality on good food. dinner. And I was told that by very well respected, you know, um this guy, guy Mark Miller, you know, very well respected um American restaurateur, and he said that's the only issue. He said it's not about your population size or density. He said you're just basically priorities. Your, your priorities. I mean, yeah. that's what people want to spend. Yeah, spend their money on. It's also that that stupid argument around I can't afford it um, because we have a healthcare crisis at the other end of the the life cycle. Mm. So it's the pay the farmer now or pay the doctor later attitude. But we don't seem to be able to get people to understand that despite us having 16 and 17 year olds contracting diabetes and you know 70 odd percent of the population being mm. obese we still don't look at food as nourishment and medicine we look at it as an essential thing that the cheaper I can get it despite what its nutrient quantity is or quality mm. is then that's the only game I'm playing mm. you know? no no I agree but um Look, if, if people seem to be very happy to drop 16 bucks on a cocktail, but, you know, ask them to, you know, pay that for a plate of bacon and eggs, you know, with a farm reared kurabuda pork and, you know, free range eggs. I mean, they want their chickens to be happy, but they don't want to pay for it, yeah. you know. And, mm. but the more space you give a chook, the, the more it costs. It yeah. And yeah. And the more it costs, but the higher the nutrient quality of it too. I think, yeah. that, you know, this is again something we've been talking about when until people are prepared to pay by the nutrient, then it's always a game of quantity and cost mm. rather than investment. Um, why then do the quadrants and KKRs of the world invest into Rockpool and Dixon AVC? Oh, this is tricky. Hope you're not listening, Neil. Um, We've had Neil on. He's all good, man. <laughs> You know, Look, I credit to him. I um. Look, some of these some of these businesses are, um, you know, they're speculative. The gamblers, you know, they get in there. They're using other people's money. Mm. Um, I think that people are shocked when they get in there and see the actual returns. Mm. Um, especially once the books are cleaned up. I mean, I know the guy from Swiss Vitamins probably. <laughs> rethinking his investment. Yeah, no shit. <laughs> <laughs> um, and he, he said, what I don't understand is a very sophisticated person said that he expected to see a couple of potholes, you know, in the books. But if That's get, what Quadrant said about Rockpool? Well, that Rockpool was the same. and yeah. and um, But they were already running, they are already running, a lot of this thing with Neil wasn't his issue. I mean, they were already carrying some... Uh, some fairly heavy issues in regards to wages themselves from their other their other outlets. Yeah. You know. Um but in terms of the Swiss vitamins guy, you know, he said he he said that he expected to see a couple of potholes in the books, but I think he didn't expect the chasm that he drove himself into. Mm -hmm. So um You'd be a good So I see I see a lot of these people have got into these businesses, I think um pushing for a possible IPO, you know, and to really to really clean up. Um, but I don't think um, that's going to happen. They've just had to get back and uh, really look at really look at what they've got, you know. And um, the thing is that they own their um, 
they own their um, percentages, no matter what happens, really. Mm. Yeah, and I think the 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 plan for those guys is to take the brand and then go into the pubs, as you said. You know, like the the the, the latest thing with Quadrant and mm. and Rockpool is four hundred. Is it Bavarian that they've got? Is that mm. their their, their yeah. pub brand yeah. to to open four hundred of those in the US because they don't see a viable exit here in Australia? No, that's right. And and then and I was just about to say that. I mean, a lot of this is the US model. Mm. Um. Quadrant would be a, a tiny business in terms of the restaurant industry in in the US. Mm, of you know, course, it's 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 tiny. That the market is enormous, and that US model was bought here. Um, it just doesn't work. There's no return. I mean, the the profit margins in the US are working between fifteen and twenty percent because they don't across pay the board salaries. Yeah, the, the labor cost nine dollars. Yeah, nine dollars, and even. When it's heading up to in some states like to fifteen dollars, they'll be paying soon mm. as minimum wage. It's nowhere near what mm. we're what we're paying here, and you've got a country that's va- vast wealth, you know, mm. vast wealth, vast population, mm. yeah, and hungry, hungry, yeah. They like food, they do, and they like food more than booze. Yep, you know, we 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 do have a big drinking culture more so than a, a food culture. Yep, you know, outside of those very small pockets of Sydney and Melbourne. You know, Ordin- ordinary Australians don't really value food in the way we value food. We're working very much in a niche market. Yeah, red you rooster know, maybe food but, food for fuel. You yeah, know. yeah, or food oh. food to fill your belly, not even fuel. Yeah, yeah, certainly not nutrition. Well, value is seen in amount rather yeah, than that's exactly yeah. the problem, isn't yeah. it? You know, they're paying for quantity, not nutritional value. Yeah, yeah. What about the advent of things like Marley Spoon and HelloFresh? Like that again must be just chipping away at the number of times that people go out and eat at a venue. Um, yeah, it does. Um, I guess it, this goes back to this time poor in a city. You know, I, I see it as sort of an elite choice, you know, because I don't really see any value. I mean, the main thing I see is the loss of uh, loss of skills in people. Mm. They've no, they no longer know how to cook, and that's mm. what this is about. Um, one of the other issues with this disruptors, disruptors, you know, like the Marley spoons and those types of things, and there are many other delivery services, and you yeah. can see even the supermarket shelves are now being stacked with ready to eat. Mm. Stuff um, ready to cook. Ready yeah. to cook. You've yeah. got Deliveroo. You've got your Uber Eats. Yeah. Um, they do eat into the market. It's not direct competition. What I think it does uh, do is uh, sort of uh, dampen the appetite to pay more on, in restaurants when they're sitting down. It's kept sort of a psychological cap. It's mm-hmm. put a real lid on, on uh, being able to raise prices because people's idea of um, the value in uh, the value of the plate is is, is Changed because they can now eat it at home. Well, they eat it at home. They get it, and they can say, "Oh, well, this costs seventeen fifty. Why am I paying? You know, why am I paying thirty five in a restaurant seat? Mm. You know, because they just see plate for plate. But it's not restaurants are selling much more than that. You yeah, know, the experience, said, the premium quality d- version of well, it's it. It's a degree and- of escapism as well. Yeah. It's a degree of taking yourself out of your. I mean, yeah, you can sit in front of your lounge and your telly tray and watch. Um, mm. You know whatever crap you're watching, Bachelorette or whatever, but it's not, you know, um, what it's if not eating in a great table? restaurant. Hmm? What if they're watching the final table? Yeah, entirely that's diff- different. Entirely different thing. Because that's mate. a very discerning. Because I'm on it. so can- <laughs> <laughs> You go home. I'm the big, world's biggest hypocrite, right. <laughs> but it's a fair point, you know. Like we, we had this conversation with um, the MD of Rangers Valley. Mm. You know, he was on the show a couple of weeks ago and they now sell their product into Coles. Yeah. And we say, we're like, what are you doing to your brand you know, and how do you preserve that and how do mm. you think about it? Because people just see Rangers Valley and they walk into Rockpool and they're paying 85 bucks for a steak yeah. and they go into Coles and they can see they can buy it for $12. And the reconciliation is, well, it's just Rangers Valley. They don't understand the difference between the grades or, or the provenance. I'd, I'd, and I didn't know that. I wouldn't, I would have, I, I don't understand that at all. From a marketing, pure marketing perspective, oh, it idiotic. just completely devalues your brand. One hundred percent. You want to sell it to supermarkets? Come up with another brand. Mm. That's the time old 
way. There's you need to have a you we could, we could hire a you as a consultant, Mark, and yeah. come on and have that conversation for what us. What I'm very good at learned over my years. The biggest thing I ever learned is mm. marketing. How to market myself. How mm. to I've had enough of it, and I've seen all of the different mechanisms. You know, yeah, I know what works, know what doesn't, and yeah. You know, anyway, Rangers Valley, yeah, dumb yeah. idea. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I, lo- I love it. Um, well, I sell it on the ships. We sell a we sell a shitload. It took a lot of effort to get it out of um, Rangers you know, Valley onto, onto the ships. Yeah, we yeah. sell. I've had, run steakhouses on three ships. You know, four and a half thousand passengers. We sell a lot of meat. Yeah, it's and fucking why we can't get enough of it because you guys. Sorry. Anyway, the um, and you pay too much for it, but the brand. But it's people buy into the Australian brand. People mm. buy into, yeah, so especially out of Hong Kong into China, where yep. um, you know the, the vast sort of cultural differences. But what they want to know is about it's not about what I'm cooking, but more where is it from? You say Australia, you know, like my oysters from you and McCash Bateman's Bay. You know, signature oysters. They mm. go, where are your oysters from? And if you'd said China, they'll have one cooked. Um, <laughs> Australia, they can eat their whole body weight in mm. them freshly shucked. Yeah. And that's just about food safety. Yeah. So um, people have done oysters? it. Hmm? They cook oysters? Of course. Wow. What? Kilpatrick. You yeah. never had oyster Kilpatrick? No. Delicious. I like them raw, man. Steamed at Golden Century with ginger and shallots. Oh, Unbelievable. Really? Okay. So good. I'll go. Yeah. I'll go. Um. Anyway, um. Yeah, so they just buy into the Australian. They just buy into the Australian brand, um, and uh, buying into a lot the folklore around Australia and its farming, green verdant hills, and mm. you know, red dirt and cattle and everything. They understand that mm. in terms of a brand, and uh, that's what Rangers Valley brings. And I sell it, sell it on board. Yeah. Absolutely love it, and yeah. uh, just blows everything else out the water so yeah well when your guests come to australia because i think one of your cruise line is coming later this year yeah, yeah? don't October. let them go to coles man oh you'll be name. fucked <laughs> <laughs> um plant-based food yep plant-based meat cell-based meat we chatted a little bit offline yeah where do you stand on it um look i see it as i i do acknowledge that there's an issue from, um, from uh, you know, sort of a bovine product. You know, people the grazing, um, the intensive farming, etc. Uh, in terms of climate change and land degradation and all of those sorts of things, and um, they're not the farmers that we deal with, mm-hmm. um, who are extremely responsible or and, and uh, are playing an idealistic in their own way and playing the long game, and yeah. protecting their own brands and. Uh, coming up with an incredible product. The issue is, as we are saying before, is um, about these chains like Burger King, et cetera, the fast food industry and, and cheap meat on the, on the, um, on the supermarket shelves. Mm. Meat is very cheap on the supermarket shelves within the Woolies chain and uh, same thing's happening with meat that happened with milk. They're see, seeing, treating these um, things as lost leaders, lost leaders yeah. and someone has to pay. And in this case, it's the environment, and um, it's also the farmer, and ultimately the consumer. I dare ultimately say. the consumer yeah. because it doesn't, it can't last. It can't last, and it's it's typically the the nastiest of all product. Yeah. So yeah. I see plant I see plant based um, things as as a good alternative. Um, evidently, uh, it's now online for um, with Burger King in the US and doing extremely well and the consumers are absolutely loving it and actually prefer it to the original beef patty and that's because the original beef patty was just, you know, Shit. imported from Argentina, ground, you know, lips, tits and dicks and yeah. cardboard, you know, mm. and that's what it tasted of, you know, and um, so that's that's where it's working well. Look, I can, you know, lived, in, lived through the 70s, I mean, Meat replacements like nut meat in a in a, <laughs> in a loaf. I mean, it's always been around. Yeah, um, and it always disappears. Yeah, but look, vegetarian cuisine is is been around since time began. I mean, the, one of the great greatest cuisines in the world is uh, is uh, Indian vegetarian cuisine, mm. whether it's Parsi cuisine or whatever. But 
But just, that's just cuisine, un, 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 unbelievable. That's whole food. And this year's just talking about one product, though. Yeah, but, but but this is the, but this is the the main game, though, and I think this is the the disconnect. If we were talking about beautiful, wholesome Indian food, vegetarian, right. vegan food, I think that's a great conversation. Yeah. The problem is that the likes of you. Beyond Burgers, Impossibles, etc., is that they're presenting themselves as that, whereas what they are is a product of monoculture that's no better for the environment than grazing animals, that it's heavily industrialized and yeah. the carbon footprint of doing that is enormous. And then they're freezing it and shipping it all around the world, which again, from a, an environmental perspective, is all disastrous. Right. So, it's, having, All right, having said that, but the yeah. same thing's happening with the burger patties. So this is I at see, the commodity end. The commodity end. Yeah, I it's agree. exactly the same thing. Like yeah. they're um, they're knocking down vast ways of of jungle to grow intensively rare beef, which mm -hmm. is then put through the grinder to be shipped off mm -hmm. from South America, or wherever in the world. Yep. So I see it's taking one one thing out of the out of the chain of degradation. Mm. You know, but isn't that the point? Though? I don't really it, care it, about people that eat burgers anyway. Yeah. What? <laughs> what about good burgers? Good burgers are great. Yeah, well, that's it. But so you've got to if, be careful about what you say. But if you've ever had one of your uh, incredible wagyu patties mm. and chucked it on the big green egg and the you know it's one of the I'm tastiest a, things on the planet, tastiest thing on the planet. But that's, that's my point, different. Mark. People need to start. Well, people need to stop talking about plants and animals and start talking about good farming practices and bad farming practices. Correct. And that's just the end of the story. Yeah. And yield and things like that. I mean, look, there's, we can easily feed the entire population now. It's what our food distribution systems and, you know, the amount that some portions of the population eat as opposed to others, the waste, there's all other sorts of factors mm. involved in this this thing about how we're going to feed the world. Mm. You know, so I think some of their their marketing of their product is is bullshit, you know, um and and disingenuous and and, and untrue, you know. Mm. Um but they're selling they're selling a product and there's a demand. I don't for I don't, it I don't really see how it's threatening anything that you've currently got on your plate it, it doesn't threaten us the only the only thing that concerns us is that there is this crazy narrative around meat is bad and plants are good and it's just it's just gross misrepresentation so we we don't have a problem with whatever they do we just want them to be a little bit more transparent in their in their in their research and in what they're presenting to people because the vast majority particularly of those burger eating people not the yeah. wagyu burger on the green egg that you're talking about but the the masses you're talking QSR, cheap food you're talking like one dollar people $1 that can eat for three dollars yeah you know, absolutely right. and and typically uneducated people that that you know are, are very easily guided down a path um, where they think they're doing the right thing for themselves and the planet. And I just think that's wrong. And so no one seems to be having the conversation, so we just keep having it. And it's a bit of fun too. Look, I think if it's not just it's not just the ignorant, people do like it, they're addicted to it. And I also think it's not just poor people, but a great deal of poor people do have to eat that food because mm. that's all they can afford. Mm. And perhaps if there's a... Some little moral moral tick that they can tick off while they're doing it. Well, I, th I think it's okay, but um, I don't think anyone's really thinking about that. No, they either like the taste or they don't like the taste. It doesn't taste good, man. It's I'm, <laughs> <laughs> like they might be getting better all the time, and they might say it bleeds, and you know, but it's just it's, it's just, just a glorified. Treat. Yeah, yeah I, don't, I don't. I don't. I don't care about you know. I just I, I love. I love um, sort of predominantly plant-based diet myself. You know, yeah. like I've always loved vegetables, and it's just yeah, been a thing too. of growing up in the country. I mean, that's yeah. We love to eat. Um, we we grew vegetables, and they come on in in abundance, and you have to learn to do things with them, mm. preserve them, eat them, eat them all sorts of ways. And by the end of the season, you're thoroughly sick of it. But by the next season comes around, you're ready, ready for it, ready again. to go again. Yeah, you know, and um, that's just how things were. But um, yeah. Do you know. still largely eat like that, like seasonally? Yeah. And I spend I spend a lot of you. Know, we spend a lot of money on food. We love it. Yeah, I love to cook at home. 
um, I spend as you know much as I can afford without being ridiculous. I mm. mean, uh, price is not always an indication of quality. I just like beautiful seasonal things. And mm. where um, are your favourite places to get it from locally? Because you're you oh, eastern I suburbs. Live in, I live right in the eastern suburbs. You know, just go up, head up to Paddington, Paddington, Maloney's. You know, yeah. I used to have. Uh, Five Ways used to be a Thomas Ducks, which was pretty good, but yeah. then they turned it into a Metro 10. So I'm like, fucking, I didn't move all this way to go to Metro 10. No. So, well, that was Woolworths, wasn't it, going yeah, oh, but it's just you've enough just, money? You just noticed how the, uh, you just really, it's just so cynical and you see how degraded all of the products start to become, it become became. very, very gen generic and mm. uh, low nutritive value and um, mm. they're older, the products are older, they're, they're packaged in plastic, all sorts of things. Mm. Um, interesting to see, yes, they are far more affordable, but I don't think there's any value there. Yeah, no nutrient value. No. Yeah, we chatted, we had these guys in here recently, um, Sprout Stack that are yeah. doing the vertical. Yeah. Guardings in the shipping containers and they were giving us the mm. stats on mm. the hockey stick curve or negative hockey stick curve yeah. with the nutritional value after a certain distance mm. travelled mm. and, and time spent. And mm. I dare say most things at, at Metro, Woolies and Coles are mm. snap frozen and in storage mm. for on, months. On the handle of the hockey stick. On the handle of the, <laughs> on the hockey stick. <laughs> the brown end where the hands meet. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, the whole mental health thing, mm. I, it's it's a big issue and it seems to be, it's a big issue globally, not just in hospitality, no. but it seems to, and maybe just because hospitality has a lot of limelight, there's a lot of big personalities, there's a lot of celebrity chefs, there's there's a lot of high profile people that have taken their own lives. Do you think it's as big a problem as the press portrays it um, and and what can we do about it if it is? Look, I see a lot of mental health is a is a massive issue, and I think that we know we no longer have the government uh, political political will nor government services or money to support the the growing need for mental health. So mm. I'm not I'm not I'm just a chef. I'm not getting into that really. Um, I see it come up more and more, and I mean, obviously, as a friend of Jeremy Strode and other notable uh, people that have taken their own life, and no, I'm known quite a few mm. um never seen anyone come up with any statistics to show that that uh um those suicides and mental health issues are represented more in the hospitality, in, in hospitality industry yeah. i've never actually seen yeah seen that study yeah if there's one out there i, w I would like to see it i anecdotally i i don't believe that we're represented anymore i think that we're um consumer facing industry so it sort of sticks out like that mm. i've also seen some um pretty cool, pretty cynical use of it in terms of uh, uh personal marketing yeah the most flagrant was you know george recently on his redemption tour on the front of the um one of the fin review magazine mm. coming out just after all this was announced you know that was probably the most egregious example of of using mental health free zone PR. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. But that's that's ongoing, and uh, it undermines the very real um, real issues within the kitchen. But I don't see there's things people don't really know what it's like in kitchens. Like in terms of um, so the public don't really know they they. So I'm always asked about, oh, it must be so stressful. I'm in mean, the hours and this. It's not like that anymore. Mm. Um, people, kitchens are very, very different to when I first started. And when I first started, they were already changing. Mm. You know, maybe not in Britain. It took a while, but um, that hazing and bullying was a thing that went on forever. Mm. And it takes generations to wipe out, like in anything, like in the armed forces, whatever. That If there's a culture, yeah. it comes from the top. Yeah. And uh, and it's taken generations to to wipe out, and then you get people like me and Neil and you know Chris Mansfield, all of those people that are out and public facing that um, were completely against it and said that's not how kitchens are run, and it changes the industry. Mm. And you know, to, to look, I I don't know, and I'm sorry, you know, Jane, if you hear it and upset, but I'm just thinking that. In terms of Jeremy, you know, 
it wasn't his hours. It wasn't his own business. He was very successful, mm. highly regarded. He's in, it wasn't his own business. He, you know, there are other other factors. It's not. There's always compounding factors. Yeah. There are other factors that are external to his to his business life, to yeah. his life in the kitchen as mm. a chef. I mean, I just immediately, it's like, you know, you go to go to a restaurant. People people get food poisoned. They go, when was the last time I ate an oyster? Oh, yeah, it was an hour ago. That's what That was the that oyster. Was it, yeah. You know, it's not. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's like meat causes cancer. Mm. Yeah. Does but, it? But <laughs> what? <laughs> no, but it's that same myopic view that there's there's one. I am I am worried about Anthony's bowel health with all that barbecued meat that he eats. Yeah, yeah, really. No, he's on the health campaign. He's getting he? better. Yeah, no, he's, he's good. He's 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 dropped a bunch of body. <laughs> I'm looking after him, man. Don't you worry oh, yeah? about that big guy. Um, but back to the thing, and like the the biggest killer of men from 20 to 50 is yeah. suicide. Correct. And you can like they said that there's a similar argument with the the it's, NFL it's, players. But it's it's working. It's working class. Also a, working class men. So there's hopelessness. It's a hopelessness. It's a, it's a death of loneliness. Yeah. You know, and that's which again, it's it's sad when you see people like Jeremy that have a beautiful, loving family. But yeah. Some people are loneliest within a beautiful, loving family because it's their their own demons, and mm. and it wouldn't matter whether you were the chef or you know a professional cyclist because many of them take their own lives too it's Mm. it's just the complexity of life i think sometimes it's like people like anthony bourdain you know like he's there with eric repair he's at the height of his success like he's beaten his drug addiction he's had you know um he's he's in paris and they're just at the height of his powers in terms of artistically and everything and Mm. and he takes his own life in the middle of a shoot there's no explaining it but maybe maybe it's just rational. Like, you know, I've had this conversation. Yeah. I've got some really good friends that, that live in Aspen in Colorado, mm. which is one of the most beautiful places on yeah. the planet, bar none. They have one of the highest suicide rates per capita mm. in the world. And this friend of mine works in mental health. And mm. she was saying to me, people come there because they want to be in the mountains. It's mm. free and it's mm. easy. And they either get there and realize that they've still got the same problems and so the only option is because mm. they go, if I can't be happy here, I'm not going to be happy anywhere. Mm. Or they stay there until they get to their mid-40s, mid-50s, mid-60s and they can't ski anymore and mm. they go, fuck, I've lived grand. I'm I'm not going to be a hopeless, broke old man and it's typically the men that do yeah. it. And so I'm out. And maybe Anthony just said that. I have lived like a rock star. I'm the king and it's only I'm down sure. here, here for me. I don't know. I'm just, But all I'm of just, that. All of that is true, but and and all of that shows how complex the subject is, and that it's not just uh, it's not just about the hopeless work environment of kitchens. And I'm going to get a little down on that characterization mm. of of the industry. I, I don't. It's just people. People and men in particular. Men. Yeah. And we have mostly men. Yep. Over over representation of men in kitchens, mm. and I think that if there was a more gender balance, I think that there's a, there's a balancing. Thing there, the yin and yang thing mm. comes in. Why isn't there more? I've never quite understood it because it just seems like something that women, sh- well, they are. They're great at it. Well, the kitchen, are they just smarter the kitchen, because they realise the that kitchen they don't environment want to do it? has been pretty you know, male dominated, and, male dominated, and, and just the characterisation of it. It sounds like you're no, you know, you're running over the, jumping out of the trench in the Somme. Mm. You know the way people characterise it. You know, and like it's no wonder that women don't want to go into it. Mm. And traditionally, it has been long, arduous hours and um, no room for family whatsoever. But I think that's that's changing a lot. And you know, with I'm working with the IMG and the World Restaurant Awards, and um, you know, with that's a new awards um, that started last year. And what uh, are they all about? Um, it was just I think a reaction to some of the other awards, like World's Fifty Best, which is sort of um, in a way, become and criteria become, and yeah, it's just it's yeah. a list, you know. And um, if you don't fit it, you don't qualify. Well, it started to 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 morph, you know. It started to corrupt, self corrupt as the money, <laughs> the amount of money generated by it um, starts to generate these little sort of polyps of corruption, which are people actually cooking for the awards. The mm. way that they um, way that they cook, the amount of money required. 
Impossible. Um, it starts. It just starts to become about the dollar. Yeah. At every level, and um, so I think the World Restaurant Awards um, was very different. Um, even the way that um, it just wasn't another list. It was um, the the categories were uh, maybe some people saw them as flippant. You know, uh, mm. best untattooed chef, for instance. But a lot of it was just <laughs> they were just funny things that were just reactions you know to current the oh, current okay. sort of cliches and tropes of of the cooking world so yeah how many untattooed chefs are there like not one, many one percent yeah there's me i think yeah yeah none for you i don't know just what. the the scrotum piercing for you just <laughs> <laughs> yes yeah the prince albert and the scrotum piercing other than that i'm yeah i'm penetrated but um yeah so that but gender balance was a big thing and uh what when we had our our initial, uh, we had a hundred judges, and we wanted a fifty fifty and judges because you know if you don't look for diversity, you don't find it. Of course. So this we came into this with this philosophy, but even finding fifty percent leading female chefs um, that wanted to participate was an, was an issue. And then once you start looking at restaurants run by leading female chefs, the candidature was was quite low. But mm. I think just. The idea of going into it and trying to trying to find this diversity sort of changes the conversation, changes the narrative around who's who is um, what it's like to be mm. who, who who cooks can be. You know the possibilities. What what more can everybody do to uh, attract more and better caliber females that it's seen as a not just a a blue collared pursuit. Which it seems to be that it's a genuine, beautiful, creative um, career. Well, it is, but a lot of professional people get into it. You know, um, look, I don't. I'm not sure how it's going to how it's going to improve. I think because there's, um, we almost need an entirely new idea about what a restaurant is. You know. Thinking has to change. I mean, we can't we can't carry on as you're saying with, um, you know, a, um, a, a lid on what we can charge. Mm, that's got absolutely lid on change. what we can charge, and and prices fixed and variable are just going up every year. Even with CPI, which is not the only mm. force, um, you know, you're just being thinner and thinner and thinner um, profit margins. So we have to have entirely new thinking about what it means in in, uh, in restaurants, what it means to go to a restaurant, what is a restaurant, mm -hmm. all this sort of discussion. And I think that's where um, gender comes into it. And I think that changing the characterization of restaurants as tough and dangerous and arduous places mm -hmm. um, is also something else. So I want to promote, you know, this, this industry has given me incredible opportunities. You know, I, I, I travel. I travel the world. Mm. You know, platinum, platinum frequent flyer for years. You know, I'm yeah. nearly up to, nearly up to lifetime gold. Yeah, that's how wow. far. So, yeah. You know, so um, and that's just entirely through my industry and those experiences and the people that I've met. It's just mm. unbelievable, and that that sense of community that we have, and that's yeah, what I find. It's a very, it's a, it's a tiny little globe in, yeah. in my sphere of the industry, and I want to. I run around the world sort of promoting that and, and telling people about that, the joys of the industry, and that's the only reason, you know, it's a it's a passion project, you know, and you just got to find out ways of of um, getting paid for keeping it. your bottom line yeah. in the black. Yeah. Do you still describe yourself as a chef or are yeah. you an ambassador or are you a businessman? I like to say that I'm international superstar and then I just drill down into what that means. But, um, Is that your dinner party line? I'm a international man of mystery that's your line that's mine's mine. international <laughs> superstar it's just much better but <laughs> really um no um yeah of course i'm a chef you know i'm still i'm still training um um a lot of people uh, on board i i cook many dinners i've just come back from new zealand um we've cooked um, for visa wellington i played with monique fiso um, did a collaborative dinner and I'm off at the end of the month uh, to do one at Labyrinth with LG Han. Um, then I'll fly up that night at 1.10 a.m. to Beijing and I'm going to do a dinner for 20 at the Intercontinental for the cruise uh, for the cruise line for um, some sort of mm -hmm. leading VIPs. So, yes, I'm very much a chef, so that's mm. 
It's what I do. You've created a pretty amazing life for yourself. Yeah. Look, it's not all bells and whistles. You know, I've, I'm doing my best to... I, I stuck in probably my restaurant for two years too long in terms financially, but what it was going to do. So it was only once the shipping thing came along that I was able to transition out of it. Yeah. Because restaurants and, and actually any business... You, you don't sell anything. All of the goodwill goes with you. You're yeah. left with nothing. Mm. And even the young guy that went into my place, I think it sold, didn't sell it for much, 100000 bucks something, nothing mm. compared to what we'd put into it. And it was a beautiful space. I mean, it had these gorgeous architectural points in it, you know, these screens that had come from an image from Frank Lloyd Wright that we'd built and been hand-built and... Mm. This zinc bar that looked like an aircraft wing underneath probably cost us fifty thousand bucks originally, you know, fifteen years ago when we built it. Yeah. And the young guy I sold it to. He had almost no money, and I said, "Look, my own advice is to keep all of that money in the bank. Please do not come in and refurbish. Mm. Put your personality on your plate. If you want to do Italian." And he said, uh, "You know, uh, your style is, you know." Classic. I need to change. I said, okay, mate. All right. Off you go. I'll give you my advice. Off you go. So he spent he spent whatever money he had on the refurbishment and I think about six months, three days later, gone. Gone. Doors closed. Mm. And my all my beautiful stuff, my my light that came from Germany in a giant crate that, you know, <laughs> Fiber optic light with crystals, a thousand crystals, all of that in a skip. Yeah, you know, and and this is the issue is heartbreaking. I don't want to be that old man saying I know everything. I don't know everything, but you got some wisdom. Please to take, impart. please yeah. take advice. I mean, I have a lot of experience. I can tell you of my experience, mm. and there are many people like it that can tell you of my experience. But you know, people don't want to listen. They want to do their own thing. But mm. there's some advice no one no one that's it's a you know it's the death of expertise that's what we're going through now everyone's thoughts feelings ideas are more valuable than than fact you mm. know yeah and it's an industry that people have very romantic emotional mm. ideas about their own but, concept but no one's actually doing anything new no one's done anything new since yeah. fucking 1990. Yeah, like, it's not, like, I don't know enough to even not, comment. It's not but, true, but everyone's yeah. just doing the same thing. Marco Pierre White said it way back when he was famous. He said, there's nothing new. There's nothing new. He mm. said, um, you can't reinvent the wheel. All you can do is put new tyres on it. That was, his, was one of the pithy phrases that stuck in my mind. And, you know, so I always had this classic foundation, you know, um, it may look like a test on the outside, but it's a big thumping, you know, 351 Cleveland under the bonnet. Classic, you know, that's my sort of food, you know. So yeah. it was always the facade I was able to change. Yeah, I understand. But the underpinnings of it remain the same. Yeah. you got to make people happy. you got to remove them. They walk through the door. They have to mm -hmm. forget who they are, where they are. This yeah. is the fundamentals of, of hospitality that I think mm. remain the same. And is this why do you think that the likes of the Huberts and Esther and Albertos yeah. do so well? Is yeah, because absolutely. it is unstated and it's it it's magical. The food isn't the, the food is secondary. You see people, well, yeah. what do they serve at Hubert? I don't know, but oh, what a night out! Fucking you know, jazz like, and yeah. old world and yeah, yeah. No, I agree. It's it's it is about the experience. Food is food is one part of it. Mm. It's the issue with when we went out of um, maitre d'-led restaurants, front of house-led restaurants where the chef was at the back of house, we transitioned into the, the front of house lost its importance and the chef came up as the star. Mm. And then the chef's driving the entire operation from the back, you know, completely, there's a complete disconnect between the kitchen and the customer. The only connection between the kitchen and the customer was what came off the pass and what landed on the customer's table. That was the link. Mm. And before, that's not human. Like the link before was people, waiters, getting in there, you know, looking at people, the the, the psychology of it, seeing mm. what they want, seeing how fast they want it paced. Is, is it romantic? Are they arguing? Mm. What, what do they want to eat? What do they feel like? Yeah. You know, yeah. and all of this sort of stuff. And that was fed back to the kitchen and, and then 
that came out. Came that was out. the process. And yeah. once that went, that's when, you know, we, we sort of lost sight of what hospitality should be. Yeah, I understand it. What do you want your legacy to be? Uh, like it's a bit of a wanky question, but I'm I'm super curious because you seem I like think, a guy that that would I give a really shit ca- about that stuff. I you, don't really care about legacy. Really? Not really mm, at all. I don't buy that. Don't you? No. I you don't. strike me as someone that would. You know what? I don't care. Really? Because I don't I don't think I don't um I want to be well thought of in my industry. You yeah. know, well, that's I legacy. I think it's just <laughs> that's reputation, legacy. I, what, yeah, yeah. I'm I'm protective of my reputation. I'll 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 grant you that. Yeah. I'm proud of um, proud of all the young people that came through my restaurant who are continuing to make an impact on the industry and uh, add to the narrative of what Australian cuisine is. Mm. That's I think if that's a legacy, I think it's a good one. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. I have a, I have a lovely marriage, and I have a, a very fine twenty-year-old son. It's enough. Yeah, I'm assuming he's not going to be a chef. Uh, no, he's in his second year at uh, UTS doing forensic science. Wow, <laughs> smart boy! <laughs> Someone told me you are a, a, an incredibly smart guy, so maybe he's got yours. And I'm assuming Valerie's a smart woman. Valerie's too. much smarter than me. Really? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Good odds to her. She's the one with the psych and uh, English literature degrees. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Good on you, Mark. I I, I think you you you're a smart dude and you're thank an interesting you so character. And thanks I've, for coming on, man. I've loved it. Thanks so much. My pleasure.